All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with the second panel, which is designing the rules and adjudicators. So now, taking from our kind of larger theoretical concerns that we started with the first panel, and moving into some more specifics with specifically how we would design uh, adjudication and think more about adjudicators, and often in very specific programs as well. I'm Kim Barnett uh, from the University of Georgia, and I'm going to very quickly introduce um, our panelists. And I hope they'll forgive me, but I am going to significantly abbreviate their uh, very outstanding biographies just to give you a sense of who's on the panel. Uh, we're you know, each going to speak for a brief amount of time and we'll leave about 20 minutes at the end for questions. And, and we hope you really will engage with our, our, our presentations and, and, and push us a bit on what it is we're preparing for today. So, as I said, I'm Kim Barnett from the University of Georgia. And most of my research focuses either on judicial review or as apropos for today on uh, agency adjudication and most specifically on adjudicators themselves. And that's what I plan to talk about today with my project for the symposium. Uh, next to me, I, I know you all know him, it's uh, Professor Michael Frakes. Uh, he is a professor of law and economics here at Duke Law School. He graduated from MIT, Harvard Law School, and has his PhD from MIT as well. He is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and focuses on empirical matters concerning health policy and IP agency adjudication, both patent and trademark. Uh, with him is his uh, often partner in crime and many different um, uh, pieces that they've worked on together, Melissa Wasserman, who is the Charles Tilford McCormick Professor of Law at the University of Texas School of Law. Uh, she is a graduate of Penn State NYU School of Law and has her PhD from Princeton in Chemical Engineering. Uh, she clerked for Kimberly Moore on the federal circuit, and she focuses her research on uh, really the intersection of administrative law and IP uh, adjudication, again, both patent and trademark. And they're going to be speaking to us today more specifically about the adjudication of trademark claims. Uh, next to them, we have uh, another uh, duo who has worked quite a bit on adjudication for several years together. Uh, first, Michael San Ambrugio. He's a professor of law and associate dean for research at Michigan State University College of Law. He has been a past and current uh, academic consultant for ACUS that we heard about in the earlier panel. He graduated from Columbia University, NYU graduate school, and NYU's law school. He had what may be thought of as one of the best clerkships in the country. He clerked for an associate justice on the Supreme Court of Hawaii, uh, which is <laughs> what everyone should be doing after law school. And then focused his research on mass agency adjudication, justiciability, and judicial review. And uh, speaking with him today will be Adam Zimmerman, who is a professor of law and uh, Gerald Rosen fellow at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Uh, he, too, like Michael, is a past and current academic consultant for ACUS. He graduated from uh, University of California, Berkeley. His JD is from Georgetown University. And after law school, he clerked for Jack uh, Weinstein, who just stepped down, as we were talking about, and uh, retiring uh, fully from the Eastern District of New York. Uh, 53 uh, years. That's right, 98 years old. Um, and his research, too, focuses on mass adjudication. He's worked in this field in various contexts that you don't see. It, it's very unique in civil, criminal, and administrative law, thinking all the ways in which mass claims are addressed. And then uh, uh, another professor I know you know well, uh, Artie Rye, who is uh, the Elvin Laddie Professor of Law here at Duke Law School, and she's the faculty director of the Center for Innovation Policy at Duke Law. Uh, she was the former administrator of the Patent and Trademark Office's Office of External Affairs. She's a former public member of ACUS, a principal investigator on numerous projects for organizations, including the National Institute of Health. She graduated from Harvard College and Harvard Law School, and she graduated for Judge Marilyn Patel on the Northern District of California. And her research focuses, too, on administrative law, health policy, health and pharmaceutical intellectual property as well. So with that introduction, we'll go through our, our various presentations, and I said take questions uh, towards the end. Um, I, I, in this awkward position of both being a moderator and a presenter in this one, so I guess I'll take the privilege and go first. And as <laughs> you can see, the, the name of my project is Regulating Impartiality in Agency Adjudication. And the thesis, I think, is quite simple, which is that agencies and the executive branch itself can use what I call impartiality regulations to mitigate or moot 
a competing constitutional clash between the Due Process Clause and Article II that Supreme Court precedent as of late has created, and that's working its way through legal challenges through the, through the lower courts. So how is it exactly that the executive branch can help us, if not resolve, again, at least mitigate some of the concerns that are arising over the protection from at-will removal that administrative law judges currently have? So let me start by just framing the nature of the quandary or the, the competition between clauses. First, we have due process concerns, and the Supreme Court has been very clear that impartiality is required for agency adjudication. And unlike what we talked about much in the earlier panel, where we have these cost-benefit uh, determinations under Matthews v. Eldridge for the kind of process, the court has treated impartiality as much more binary. You're either impartial or you're not impartial, but not something that has at least expressly been viewed under a cost-benefit lens. That said, it's often very difficult to know exactly when one is sufficiently impartial or when one is partial. We will look at one's actual state of mind, subjectively. Are you impartial? The problem is we almost never do it because it's so difficult to ascertain. Instead, we will look for objective manifestations concerning the appearance or the probability of partiality. And the court's given us a few guidelines, but not much, that certain financial incentives on the part of the adjudicator can lead us to think that the adjudicator may be biased, or certain relationships between the adjudicator and the parties could create a problem. Well, if you're thinking about administrative law judges who work for their agencies, I think you can start to see where we get some tensions to the extent that they're getting paid salaries by an agency and the agency showing up a party and the agency is also the one who's deciding whether or not you keep your job and what your job detail actually looks like, we could start having some issues. Or if we are non-administrative law judges, we could have even more problems where the agencies actually pay bonuses to the adjudicators in those particular areas. This other provision that the Supreme Court has mentioned from time to time in the Article II context is one that I, I focused on a bit, and I think it speaks to these due process concerns, especially with agency adjudicators. And it says, one who holds his office only during the pleasure of another cannot be depended upon to maintain an attitude of independence against the latter's will. Well, that would mean if one can remove you at will, you're going to do the superior's bidding. On the flip side, if you're protected from at-will removal, you have some space, independence, and it furthers notions and appearances of impartiality. Administrative law judges currently have protection from at-will removal, and as we'll see, this is going to be part of the tension, that largely addresses these due process concerns. Indeed, going back to Professor Kovacs's uh, discussion of how the APA came to be, this was central to creating the APA's adjudicatory model, having administrative law judges that have this kind of protection from at-will removal. There's Article II. With Article II, we have a bevy of cases where the Supreme Court has approved of congressional action that protects executive officials from at-will removal. The wrinkle comes in a case from 2010 called Free Enterprise Fund versus Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, or often called Peekaboo. And what it <laughs> concerns are tiered protections from at-will removal. And it held that the protections in that case violated Article II. And just understand what these are, for those of you who aren't familiar with the case. We had the president who could appoint uh, through senatorial confirmation and remove, for certain good causes, SEC commissioners. The SEC commissioners, in turn, could appoint and remove the peekaboo members, and we could remove them for certain good causes. So between the president and the peekaboo members, we had two tiers of protection from at-will removal. And the court held that these two tiers together impeded the president's supervisory power under Article II, and in response, severed the second of the two, meaning that the peekaboo members could be removed at will by the SEC members. The dissenters, there were four dissenters, led by, oops, led by Justice Breyer, and what he asked was, well, what about all of the other executive officials that have this tiered protection from at-will removal? And he goes through numerous uh, officials that have this, but the one that's most apropos for today were administrative law judges, and administrative law judges do have tiered protection. Now, it's a little easier for them to start at the bottom. 
ALJs have protection from at-will removal. They can only be removed by the Merit Systems Protection Board, which itself, uh, its members can only be removed by uh, good cause existing from, uh, by the president. So between the president and ALJs, we have two tiers of protection from at-will removal. And the majority responds in a footnote fairly briefly and first says, well, that's not this case, and then says, but there are possible ways of distinguishing them. One is that ALJs might be employees as opposed to inferior officers like the Peekaboo members. Well, the court said exactly the opposite several years later, where they said at least the SEC ALJs are inferior officers, and that's been understood to mean essentially all, if not all, ALJs are officers. So this first distinction has been pushed aside. The second is, well, they provide recommendatory decisions uh, that uh, merely serve as recommendations for the rest of the agency. That's true sometimes, but not always. Indeed, the default under the APA is that they issue initial decisions that can be final. They're only recommendatory if the agency enacts a rule to render them such. Moreover, to the extent that we don't think ALJs are employees anymore. For similar reasons that ALJs are not employees, many non-ALJs would also be officers, and many of those can issue final decisions and initial decisions that are not recommendatory decisions. The takeaway is that the potential distinctions between peekaboo and ALJs, they certainly won't work for all agency adjudicators, and they may not work for many of them at all when it's said and done. If that's true, and if we follow free enterprise fund, then we would expect that the protection for the ALJs and non-ALJs that protects them from at-will removal would fall away. And then they can be removed by their agency at will, implicating the due process concerns. So what might we do about this if we're gonna have a clash between these two provisions? And what I say is let's turn to executive branch law, or as uh, Chris Walker's written quite a bit about internal administrative law. And this was probably most uh, conceptualized in a law review article by now Justice Kagan called Presidential Administration with the idea that what internal administrative law does is allow for efficiency control of policy throughout agencies, where the White House takes everything together and it it implements through executive action how to get its policy choices throughout the executive branch. But there can be other ways of using internal administrative law too. And that can be used as a form of what's referred to as internal separation of powers too, where we now limit what it is that the agencies can do before they can act. Uh, the, the chief proponent of this is now Judge uh, Nina Pillard on uh, the DC Circuit, where she said, you can create more legitimacy for executive action by limiting how you act to ensure that there's more consistency throughout the adjudicatory, in this case, process, or by protecting individual rights. And she thought primarily about things like free exercise, and the executive branch could go above and beyond what's required under the First Amendment. But if we're talking about individual rights, we could also be talking about due process and your ability to have an adjudicator who is impartial. What's nice about using internal administrative law is that it's fully consistent with the unitary executive theory that if not all of the Supreme Court's more conservative members have fully bought into, they're at least sympathetic to the notion of it. And in Free Enterprise Fund and in the dissent to Morrison v. Olson by Justice Scalia, who was dealing with protections from at-will removal there, they all agree that if the president uses internal administrative law, it presents no constitutional problem at all. If that's true, then the due process, I'm sorry, the Article II issue falls away, and we're left just with the due process concern. The downside, of course, I think is fairly obvious. Unlike a statutory protect protection from at-will removal, we have less permanence. Whatever one administration does, the other administration following in time can undo it. Now, you can create more permanence in certain ways, such as through notice and comment rulemaking, where at least repeal would require just as much process. But make no mistake, it, it isn't quite as good as uh, statutory action. That said, if there really is tension between Article II and due process, this may be the best that one can hope for, that the Constitution wouldn't allow a statutory cure. What would this look like more specifically? And I'll deal with this uh, 
fairly quickly, and if people have questions, we can talk about it during the Q&A. I would follow the special counsel regulations. Now, the executive branch from essentially the beginning of the 20th century has a long and often forgotten history of protecting those within the civil service from direct oversight from uh, the political operatives within the agency and creates good cause protection. What's one of the latest versions of this? The Clinton administration special counsel regulations where following a page out of Justice Scalia's dissent, they enact regulations and protect the special counsel from at will removal. The AG can remove only with uh, cause. I would implement this through what I call impartiality regulations. There would be an executive order that instructs the agencies to enact through notice and comment rulemaking impartiality provisions. What would these look like? Well, first, we would have to define what adjudicators are. ALJs are easy. They're a discrete class. Mm -hmm. They're defined. What's harder are non-ALJs. And even with ACUS, there's been two different reports that take two different definitions of this, where non-ALJs could equal the number of ALJs, or it could be about five times more number of ALJs. <laughs> we have to think what this looks like and where we would want these applied. What are the subject matter? I would deal with adverse actions, removal and discipline, putting in that removal or discipline can only occur for good cause. We could deal with appointment. There have been changes as of late to the appointment for ALJs. It is no longer necessarily a merit-based system for hiring. And then other indicia of impartiality, much of what we've already discussed in the first panel, ex parte communications, separation of functions, to ensure that those kind of concepts, which right now are not uniform for non-ALJs, are applied through an internal regulation. And I'll leave off with just this one example. For adverse actions, this isn't hard. All you do is copy the language from the statutes that exist right now to protect ALJs and apply it to all adjudicators as defined, so ALJs and non-ALJs, so that they can only be removed for good cause without triggering the free enterprise conundrum which has arisen since 2010. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. I'll put my moderator hat back on. And I'll turn it over to uh, Melissa and Michael, who are going to kind of hone in on a more specific form of adjudication, that of trademark adjudications. Um, so thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking both our Emily and Kent and Chris, um, as well as the members of Duke Law Journal for um, organizing this terrific conference today. Um, so the article I am presenting is co-authored with Michael, and it empirically um, examines heterogeneity and trademark office adjudications. So I'm going to start by providing the motivation and some institutional detail, and then I'm going to turn it over to Michael, who's going to uh, present our results. Okay, so uh, basically, or at the basics, is a trademark is a word, phrase, symbol, design, or combination thereof that identifies and distinguishes goods and services of one party from another. And though trademark rights actually arise out of use, not federal registration, um, the successful federal registration of a mark confers a number of important legal rights and benefits for the registering party. So, for example, registration provides a trademark registrant with the right of priority that has nationwide effect um, against anyone else in the nation who utilizes the mark after the date of application. And once a mark has been registered for five years, it becomes incontestable, which means that the grounds in which its validity can be challenged is narrowed. So these benefits, along with a number of other ones, um, are so significant that it's commonplace that trademark owners now almost always file um, for federal registration of their marks. And this is reflected in the data. At the end of the fiscal year of 2018, there's 2.4 million active trademark registrations in the United States. And during that same year, the Trademark Office received 660,000 new applications, which was about a 60% increase from the decade prior. So yet, despite this increasing significance of federal registration marks, there's been growing concern um, that the Trademark Office is making inconsistent uh, determinations about registration. And so one controversy that's been in the news recently is the, the Trademark Office's review of the mark called the Vegan Butcher. So there's um, Herbaceous Butcher, which is actually a sister and brother um, a meat substitute butcher, right, in Minnesota. And they filed 
for uh, registration for the mark the vegan butcher for meat substitutes. And it was refused on the ground that it's merely descriptive. So typically you can't get a mark for something that's merely descriptive because it doesn't serve as a source identifier without having something called secondary meaning. Anyway, so shortly thereafter, a different trademark official at the trademark office approved Sweet Earth Food, which is a subsidiary of Nestle Foods, federal registration for vegan butcher for meat substitutes, right? So it seemed like the identical thing where the agency came out differently in their adjudication. So now um, Herbershevich is... Um, suing, right, and they're in sort of a protracted legal over who actually has um, the federal registration over, over vegan butcher. Vegan butcher. Um, so examples like this, I think, implicate concerns that the trademark office's decision to grant a federal um, registration is driven not only by the merits of the application, but also by the proclivities of the actual trademark official that's reviewing the application. Um, okay, so now let me just give you a quick overview of the trademark registration process. So it said registration is really an examination process, right? To obtain a federal registration, you need to file your application at the trademark office. Once it's received, then the trademark office randomly assigns your application to an official um, known as a trademark examining attorney. So the first pass on whether your uh, registration meets the requirements occurs in an informal adjudication. It's really a negotiation between the examiner and the applicant about whether the application meets the um, requirements. And these federal registration requirements incorporate the basic doctrinal principles that govern the validity of a trademark. So there are things such as the mark must possess either inherent or acquired distinctiveness. It can't be confusingly similar to other, some other mark that came before it. So if the trademark examining attorney determines the mark is registrable, it gets published, and then you have a 30-day opposition period where third parties can come and file an opposition proceeding before something called the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, which is the adjudicatory body at the trademark office. And this proceeding is formal-like. Um, and so you have, can possibly have discovery and oral argument. Um, after this 30-day um, period is gone, um, you have one other way um, where you can challenge um, the validity of, of this mark at the trademark office, and this is through a cancellation proceeding where third parties can come again to TTAB or the uh, Trademark Trial and Appeal Board and challenge um, the registratability of the mark. Again, this is a formal-like um, adjudication. Okay, so what is the harms associated with the trademark office Right, if it's treating similar applicants in dissimilar ways. Well, I think first there's a concern about quality, right? If examiners are supposed to be applying the same requirements and they're coming out differently, right, this doesn't give us a lot of hope that they're getting the right answer most of the time. Um, and because the trademark registration standards are set to generally parallel the economic justifications for trademarks, which is enabling the public um, to easily identify a particular product from a particular source without unduly restricting competition, if trademark examining attorneys are allowing invalid trademarks to be registered, these trademarks could impose the costs of these additional legal rights on society without the benefits. Um, so going back to the first example um, I gave you, if the trademark office incorrectly granted um, the application on the vegan butcher, right, even though it was descriptive, what this could mean is that sweet foods could encumber sort of um, entrance ability to communicate with their customers, right? They're not going to be able to use this term vegan butcher to describe meat substitutes. Um, so in con I think inconsistent um, trademark registrations also could offend theories of bureaucratic justice and raise equity concerns, right? We generally want to design a system that's going to treat similar applicants in similar um, ways. So despite these um, concerns that we have with inter-examiner heterogeneity, there's been very little empirical work done on the trademark system, and in particular on the process by which um, trademark rights are obtained. And so we're trying to help fill that gap, right, and, and, and try to do a systematic examination of how much heterogeneity we actually do see in trademark um, adjudications. Okay, so we collect data on uh, individual trademark applications uh, from 1982 to the present, and we have about 7.8 million applications uh, in our data. You know, for each application, we'll know information about the, the trademark examining attorney to which the application was randomly assigned. We'll know the name of that attorney. 
Uh, we'll know um, uh, information about the outcome of the application, whether it was published, whether it was registered, and so on and so forth. Um, and we know various characteristics of the application as well, so what type of market it is, what industry this is in. Um, and so with this, I think we have about, uh, it says on the screen, about 1,300 trademark examiners that we're tracking over time. And they do a lot of these reviews over their careers, at least on average about 6,000 reviews over their careers. So uh, explaining the methods of this paper is, I think, much more straightforward and, and it's easier than our, other, and than our other work. We're essentially taking the data here and we're, we're seeing, looking at these various trademark office outcomes and seeing how they vary across uh, the trademark examining attorneys. And we're going to look at and Melissa walked through uh, the background of the, the process. We're going to look at a lot of uh, measures that are reflective of that process. We'll look at the rates by which the applications are published, the rates by which they're published on the very first decision, so a little uh, pushback at all in the first place, the, way, the rates by which they're registered. We'll look at uh, a little bit of the outcomes associated with this. So what we're going to look at, the um, uh, Melissa mentioned the opposition process, the rate by which uh, the applications are ultimately sort of subject to a, a sustained opposition through this process by the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. We're going to also look at a, a measure of processing time, uh, the duration from the application coming in until the point in time in which they've reached that publication decision. So the goal is to see sort of how much heterogeneity in these outcomes we see across trademark examining attorneys. So, let me, so let's dive in and, uh, and show you some results. We'll start with uh, the first decision, that, that publication decision. So really what we do here is for each one of the trademark examining attorneys, we'll consider all the, uh, the reviews that they've done over their career and figure out uh, the rates by which the, the percentage of those that they're actually publishing. So what we're showing here is a frequency distribution of those publication rates across the examining attorneys. And so you think on the x-axis x here is basically a different you know, publication rate bin, and the y-axis is basically given a reflection of how many trademark examining attorneys do you see in that particular publication uh, bin. And so one thing we sort of learn here immediately is we title the paper, are there as many trademark offices as there are trademark examining attorneys? And, and that's not necessarily the case from this figure. We don't necessarily see a uniform distribution out of that whole range of possibilities from zero to one. We do see some degree of clustering here. This outcome seems to cluster sort of around, I don't have it in front of me, I think around 78% or so. But we do see a bit of sort of breadth uh, in this measure. And so there's, there's some trademark examining attorneys are kind of doing it almost, they're uh, publishing almost all the time. There's a, there's a decent number that are really only publishing in the, in the 60 to 70% range. To give some more specifics here, I believe the second percentile of this distribution has a publication rate of about 56%, whereas the 98th percentile has a publication rate around um, at 100%. It's so really what this means. If you take 50 applicants, trademark applicants at random, one of those applicants is going to be assigned to a trademark examining attorney that's really only going to give you about a 56% shot uh, at getting that publication. Whereas the, uh, another one of those 50 uh, applicants drawn at random is basically going to be assigned a trademark examining attorney that's basically going to guarantee you success at the publication stage. So there is a, there is a degree of, of heterogeneity that, that we do see here. Now, one reaction you might see uh, when, and think about, you know, there's always going to be some degree of variation when, you, when, you, when you're sort of comparing any kind of outcome across people. Uh, so it could fundamentally be the truth that everybody has the same proclivity to publish. Just some examiners might have more reviews or other examiners are going to get some degree of variation. So we try to rule that out in the paper. Uh, and first of all, we do a formal test that we're, we're happy to talk about. It's, you can take a look at the paper to, to rule that out. We'll try to graphically show you um, uh, you know, the, the demonstration that this is real variation and not random variation. So really what we do in this figure is we take each one of these applications and we assign basically, we randomly assign a placebo outcome. Is it published? Where that placebo outcome is designed to sort of on average sort of occur about 78% of the time in the data. And then you basically, for each trademark examining attorney, figure out their placebo public, uh, publication rate average. Uh, and then we'll sort of plot that distribution across. And here, what you see is it's very sort of tightly centered around that 78%. So the, the idea is the real truth that what we really see in the data is far more sort of variable relative to what we would see by, by chance alone. So these, these are real variations. Uh, another question you might have, sort of going back to the motivating figure, is you know, maybe those on the left are just reviewing different types of trademarks relative to those on the right. So they still have the same fundamental like, proclivity to publish. It's just they're sort of looking at different things. So uh, the next step we do is we try to sort of rule we try to rule that out by essentially sort of standardizing each uh, trademark examining uh, attorney's publication rate. So we get it so, so that it can, be a, it can be reflective of their inherent proclivity to publish while accounting for a bunch of different characteristics of the application. Um, and so the types of characteristics we look at, I sort of list them on the screen. You know, we'll look at the industry. We'll look at what, you know, what type of mark is it. Is it a service mark? Um, and a number, a number of other features uh, of, of the application itself. 
for those that are interested in the econometrics behind this, and I know that you all absolutely are totally interested in the econometrics, <laughs> this is actually pretty straightforward you know, that to do this. You essentially sort of regress you know, whether you take all the individual applications, you regress whether or not it was, uh, what it was published on basically indicator variables for all of these uh, different features of the application that we want to control for. And then basically a set of what we would call trademark examining attorney fixed effects, just a different indicator variable for all 1,300 of our examining attorneys. And then you estimate that, and then you, what you do is you basically form the predictions of those estimated examiner fixed effects, and then we can plot those. And really what you're doing there is you're essentially doing the same thing. You're figuring out their average publication rate, but you're doing it in a way that you're sort of accounting for the fact that they might have a different distribution of, 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 of uh, applications based on different characteristics. When you do this, it's centered around zero now, but the important takeaway here is you get the, basically the same degree of breadth, which is essentially telling you that it's not differences in the characteristics of the applications that we're explaining the breadth that we saw in that first figure. And some extent, that's not surprising here because these are randomly, these really are randomly assigned uh, across trademark examining attorneys. So uh, in the interest of time, I really just kind of wanted to walk through the sequence of results just for the publication decision. I don't have time to sort of do, go through the same three figures for all of our other decisions. Maybe I'll sort of quickly show just that first figure for some of the other measures that we're looking at. Uh, and so here, the, the next one we were looking at, that publication decision, but without any pushback, because sometimes there'll be the, the review will come in and there might be some initial pushback from the examining attorney before they render their final publication decision. But here's where they decide to publish on the very first instance. And you actually see a greater degree of heterogeneity in that outcome across examiners relative to the ultimate publication decision. Uh, next, we're looking at the, the ultimate registration rate. This turns out to be sort of a similar amount of breadth uh, and heterogeneity that we saw in the publication rate decision. Next, we sort of look at you know, the the degree to which the application is ultimately subject to a, uh, a sustained opposition at, at, at the TTAB. Here you've got a different distribution because this just happens far more infrequently, and you're going to see some clustering around, uh, around the zero range. Um, but you know, relative to a low mean, you still see a, relative, you know, a, a decent amount of, of breadth relative to the low mean. Uh, so this turns, out if you, this turns out to be relatively variable uh, as well. And then finally, we see a quite a degree of variability when we're looking at uh, processing time, uh, that duration to the publication decision. This is the only one of our measures that I think does look a little bit, I don't, if, yeah, the paper will have, it does, it does look a little, it does sort of tighten a little bit when you do that risk adjustment, that standardization process. But even after you do that, you still have sort of quite a bit of breadth really left. So um, real quickly, and you know, what other sort of things, that we, what other findings do we have? One might sort of think that, Oh, maybe if you see uh, sort of heterogeneity across trademark examining attorneys, it's not necessarily a terrible thing because maybe it's re reflecting sort of valuable experimentation. Um, and, you know, and so they might figure out the best way to do it, and people will coalesce around that over time. And there might still be some degree of variation always, but they keep sort of, they'll experiment and figure out what's the best way to go and then kind of coalesce around it. We try to sort of see, see whether or not we think this is going on by basically sort of tracking these variations over time. And it's, we don't necessarily things, see things getting tighter over time. They, still, they just kind of are staying in, in these sort of uh, you know, broad pathways. And so I do think that we're not necessarily seeing beneficial experimentation going on here that can explain all of this. Real quickly, you know, Melissa and I have really focused on the patent side. So one question might come up on that. So you've got, they're all part of the same office. Is the trademark side of the office less or more variable relative to the patent, the patent side? It can be a little bit difficult to sort of do this comparison, at least because you're really qualitatively looking at different types of decisions. Um, but nonetheless, in the paper, we do show a little bit. We do think that the patent side might be a bit more variable relative to the trademark side, although we do think that there is at least some degree of heterogeneity across trademark examining attorneys that at least implicate some of the harms that, that Melissa had identified. There could be some concerns about you know, uh, administrative justice, equity-based concerns, to the extent that applicants that get randomly assigned uh, to different examining attorneys, that will sort of give them very different shakes. Uh, and then ultimately, to the extent that, you know, as Melissa sort of laid out, there are, we think that the, these decisions are, should be reflecting, you know, certain uh, economic considerations, uh, and then there are certain economic justifications associated with federal trademark registration. So we, to the extent that we think that there is an economic right approach, we might be seeing variability around that right approach, and this might be uh, sort of implicating efficiency concerns. So I want to end on one note, which is basically saying, kind of thinking about where we go from here. Melissa, I really wanted to write this paper, I think, to really sort of set the stage for uh, an agenda of further research to come. So try to sort of, sort of get you to believe that, okay, this, these decisions do matter. They are, of, uh, you know, they are of consequence. We do see a lot of variability across the trademark examining attorneys and the outcomes of this process. 
And so I think the next step should be thinking about, well, what might be explaining this heterogeneity? And then to sort of uh, to theorize what uh, the explanations behind it and also come up with some, some neat ways to sort of test to see whether or not those explanations are possibly explaining the observations that we're seeing here. And I, and I think that really Melissa and I have sort of mostly contributed to this on the patent side. And so I think our work on the patent side could hopefully serve as a guide of where things might sort of go on the, on the trademark side. Obviously, we're going to sort of need to tailor to the specific institutional features of the trademark, uh, of the trademark system. So on the patent side, there was a similar paper to what we're doing right now that came out uh, by Ian Colburn and co-authors in 2003, just sort of looking at, oh, by the way, in the, on, the patent, sorry, on the patent side, we see a lot of variability in various uh, outcomes of the patent office across the patent examiners. And in the work to follow, and Melissa and I really try to contribute heavily to this, uh, to this literature, and I've listed some of our papers here, we try to, again, think about well, what could be explaining this. We weren't just concerned just with the heterogeneity. We were also concerned with the, with the level. But, but in terms of both the level and the heterogeneity, we were thinking about well, what, you know, what could be contributing to, to all of this in the patent side. So we talked about the fee structure, the fee structure combined with the, uh, uh, with the cost structure. We talked about the amount of uh, hours that were given to, uh, to examiners. We talked about an interesting feature of the US patent system, which is basically there's never really a final rejection. How much is that uh, contributing to this? And at this event four years ago, uh, which this was sort of a fun analysis that we did, we were also sort of looking at hiring year cohort effects. And really what we were sort of looking at here was to, to what extent is, are really some of these uh, variations that we're really observing by, trade, by the patent examiners sort of reflective of the fact that patent examiners are entering the system at different times and they're being sort of, you know, uh, uh, and they might be uh, imprinted upon by the philosophy, the granting philosophy of the, the, the director of the patent office at that time, which turns out that, you know, there's lots of, there are some big swings in, in the directors and their philosophies on the, on the patent system that we observed over time, and it did have sort of a big lasting impact on ultimately the new examiners that were trained under that, basically under that philosophy. We think that explains sort of quite a bit of the heterogeneity we saw there. The bottom line is we, we kind of, we, we want to set the stage for a similar series of sort of future analysis on the trademark side. Thank you. So now we'll hear from uh, Adam and Michael on mass adjudication. I'm going to stand up. Oh, I just got this. It's just That's okay. Um, I need to stand up when I talk, especially because I'm from the West Coast and I need to stay awake. Um, but I just wanted to start by thanking Kent, Chris, Emily, all the members of the Duke, Duke Law Journal for, for doing this. Um, this is a great event, and we're thrilled to be here. Um, today, we're gonna, the topic of our article is entitled Aggregate Agency Adjudication. You might be looking at that and wondering, what the hell is that? Um, what we mean by aggregate adjudication in the agency context is what we mean by aggregate litigation in federal courts. Like the typical concept across the world, if you look at statutes around the world involving agency adjudication, is that everyone should get their day in court. But there are some exceptions that exist, not only here in the United States in agency adjudication, but also around the world, that allow agencies and individuals to group together their claims, sometimes in the, like class actions, sometimes using other techniques, to more efficiently, consistently, and fairly try large groups of cases. And this area of research is something that grew out of an article we wrote in 2012, which argued that agencies should be able to hear class actions. Not only would it lead to more efficient and consistent results, but it would entitle people who might have pretty low dollar claims begin to be able to, to group together their claims and get an attorney to represent them in cases that they wouldn't be able to afford to bring alone. Um, we then studied the few agencies that did that in another article a few years ago in the Yale Law Journal, and we decided we got to go bigger. So we decided to take this global and look at other systems around the world that use exotic things like agency class actions to adjudicate large groups of cases. So my plan in the time I have is just to map this out for you, like the different kinds of aggregate adjudication, and to give you some cool examples. And then I'm going to let Michael in the minute or two I give him to, uh, <laughs> to talk about the trade-offs. Um, so there are all, all these different forms of aggregate adjudication I'm going to talk about. And really what it boils down to is you can, tra you can track the different kinds of aggregate adjudication along two dimensions. One involves how much direct participation do people have in the proceeding. Um, do people each individually get their own attorney or can you have a case where a single person or a small group of people um, are represented by an attorney who represent a whole bunch of other people who aren't directly participating? The other dimension that we'll be tracking 
is how binding the effect of the decision is. There are some cases where that single proceeding can bind thousands of other people. There are other cases where they might bind a few people, and there are some cases where the decision might be totally advisory. Um, so let me start with binding and representative aggregate adjudication and agencies, and let's start with one of the most famous ones of all that we know in the United States, which is class actions. Um, we studied um, about 70 different agencies to kind of see how many agencies use class actions right now. About nine of them have a class action rule on their books, which means you can bring a class action in an agency adjudication, in front of an agency adjudicator. And the most prominent one is the EOC, which has been doing this for quite a while. It dates back to a procedure that was originally adopted by the Civil Service Commission because the NAACP in the 1970s was very worried about NASA, which at the time was the most segregated agency in the United States. But the only way that they could bring a pattern and practice claim on behalf of all the employees at NASA was, was to exhaust their claims through an administrative process, the Civil Service Commission. So they sued and said, this agency has to hear class actions. And amazingly, a district court in Columbia said, yes, yes. And so the Civil Service Commission began hearing class actions. And now the EEOC has taken on that role. It, it's heard over the past 10 years about 125 class actions. Its rules largely track Rule 23, with one exception, you can't opt out. In Rule 23, you can opt out. And one reason for that is because when this rule was being adopted, they were largely imagining that the class action would be for injunctive relief. Change the test. Make sure that there's more reasonable accommodations. I, all of these types of solutions are ones that would broadly apply to everyone anyway, so no reason to opt out. But you can get damages in these class actions as well. Um, there aren't that many other agencies that do this sort of thing. Since we've published our report, the Department of Education has adopted a class action-like rule for uh, students seeking uh, debt relief. And uh, more recently, and more notably, an Article I court, um, the Veterans Court, uh, the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims has started hearing class actions for veterans in appeals from the Board of Veterans Appeals. And, uh, and they've certified three just over the past six months. Um, going beyond the United States shores, you can see that those types of proceedings are also used in other places. So in the Netherlands, they use a proceeding called a, a mass tax appeal process. If you don't like the fact that you've been taxed and you live abroad for health care and you're a Dutch citizen, or, or, you, uh, or if you've been taxed, your community's been taxed for, uh, to improve like a blighted neighborhood, you can challenge that with the Department of Taxation in the Netherlands. Um, and sometimes thousands of tax challenges are filed. And they needed some way to, to resolve those cases really efficiently. So very recently, they adopted a mass tax appeal process. A single person can re represent and bind many. Um, and that single case is usually chosen by the tax ministry. Um, what I have up here is something interesting. It's put up by Price, Waterhouse, and Coopers, um, who are you know, one of the big for tax accounting firms. And one of the things that you can see here is one of the other benefits that you get from class actions. Not only is this a way to kind of efficiently resolve, in this case it was 18,000 tax appeals in a single case, but you get the benefit of third party expertise, either lawyers or accountants, who can help assist you in filing your claim that you might not be able to afford if you're bringing it yourself. So they not only put up this big website, but they actually had this big letter in Dutch um, which I translated with Google Translate, um, which allows you to kind of file a very kind of pro forma application that preserves your right to challenge the capital gains tax as violating the European Convention of Human Rights. And that, that case will be decided very soon. Um, beyond the class action context in the United States, we've also used statistical sampling. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but following an incredible surge of claims with uh, the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals, which hears like Medicare reimbursement claims. They have so many cases that they very brief, they, they piloted this program where you can get a sampling, meeting with one of their government statisticians, of maybe 30 claims for, say, 1,000 particular claims. You try those 30 claims and statistically extrapolate the results to the rest. So again, binding and representative forms of litigation, of, of, of adjudication. 
Now, you can also have representative and non-binding forms of adjudication. And we see this probably most frequently with a process called the public inquiry. The public inquiry exists in many different jurisdictions outside the United States, many common law jurisdictions, UK, Canada, Australia, Israel. Um, they've been used to resolve, help provide a lot of information about hotel fires like the Grenfell Tower, which was a, a big tower that burned in London for several days, hurting a lot of people, uh, cases involving tainted blood, the blood supply in Canada. Um, and the whole idea behind the public inquiry is you get an adjudicator with subpoena power, the ability to cross-examine, you have groups of people, all affected, represented in the case, and they will produce a report that determines the cause and, and provides some recommendations of what should be, should be done. But it's totally non-binding. The agency doesn't have to do anything with that. And the most close, the closest analogy, I mean, we have actually a lot of analogies like this in the United States, but one that I think is kind of meaningful and might maybe resonate today is what's happening now with the, um, the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, and the 737 Boeing MAX. So when, when they do an investigation, they are kind of adjudicating all the facts of what's happening. They have a panel that does it. They have subpoena power. They hear from different representatives. It's a group-like proceeding. Um, but by law, none of the NTSB's findings can be used in an, a subsequent adjudication. It can't be used in a civil case. So in these types of cases, you're getting the informational benefits of aggregation, but you're not necessarily, and the expertise, but you're not getting the binding impact, the peace that you might want from MAGA proceedings. And going on the opposite end, you can have cases that are more individualized. Everyone gets their own lawyer. But they're all centralized by category in front of the same judge or category of judges. Um, you could say this is like one example of this might be the, the courts that were kind of set up to hear um, cases involving Central American children who were seeking asylum in West Texas. Um, but we're seeing it a lot in other cases as well. Like, when over 40,000 students filed for debt relief after the Corinthian ITT colleges collapsed, they assigned a special master to kind of come up with a process to just adjudicate all of those claims all in the same way. Now, everyone got a lawyer, but they're all being handled in the same kind of coordinated way, hoping to provide more efficiency and consistency. Now, one area where this is really happening in an interesting way is the use of technology to aggregate and coordinate claims. And for me, one of the most interesting areas where this is happening is the Social Security Administration. Um, as um, David Engstrom and Dan Ho uh, are documenting in a, in, a, in a soon to forthcoming article, they show how there's a new type of program that, um, that Social Security is using called batching, where they use technology to identify um, certain categories of cases, assign them to a select group of, of adjudicators, and not only do they assign the same kinds of cases to them, but they assign them in the same order. So you do like a certain set of disability cases before lunch, and then a different set after lunch. The idea is that you're improving the workflow, and they've been able to reduce their backlog significantly by using technology to kind of coordinate and aggregate those claims. Now, you can see the, the costs and benefits. We're not getting the same expertise, the same lawyer representation. We also risk more disuniformity, but we get more coordination, more efficiency by centralizing and coordinating those claims. The last one I'll just briefly mention is that we can have hybrids. We can have a mixture of all this stuff. And the most notable one is the National Vaccine Program. So the National Vaccine Program is a program that compensates kids when they're injured by vaccines. It's supposed to be on a no-fault basis. The claims proceed one at a time. But when 4,000 parents filed claims saying that vaccines cause their kids autism, it didn't make sense to adjudicate that scientific question over and over and over again. So what did they do? They came up with a bellwether trial process. They adjudicated one case, or actually three, um, with the hopes of that the outcomes of those three cases would inform the attorneys as to how to handle the remaining ones. This kind of bellwether trial process is also used in the UK as well as in the Netherlands. Um, and it was a very effective way to deal with um, those types of claims. Um, I'm going to leave it there and hand over to Michael to talk about the cost. I wasn't expecting so much time. Did I give you a lot of time? Um, OK, so in this last uh, slide here, we're talking about the kind of the promises and perils. All this sounds great, but there are some drawbacks. Aggregate procedures can alleviate these crippling backlogs. They can reduce 
arbitrary outcomes um, and appeals, promise more access to justice, pool information for agencies from the ground up and helping them to make uh, choices about enforcement and policy. Um, but each of these different forms of uh, aggregation um, also raise their own concerns um, with efficiency, accuracy, and legitimacy of, of administrative adjudication. Aggregate procedures can actually increase uh, delays and costs when in representative uh, adjudication, they make it easier for parties to file claims, even more claims than they might otherwise have done. Or in non-representative litigation, when adjudicators are forced to repeatedly resolve the same issue over and over. Um, they may also raise questions about legitimacy when not all individuals participate in these uh, proceedings, uh, lack access to counsel, or when adjudicators cannot adequately account for how their decisions um, are for, uh, forced to repeatedly resolve kind of the same issues in uh, non-representative litigation. Um, finally, administrators may struggle uh, to accurately, accept, accurately assess the large number of cases according to their individual merit. So this kind of uh, individual day in court ideal of adjudication is put under uh, serious pressure. Nevertheless, um, aggregate, aggregate procedures have evolved to address some of these concerns, and I'm going to talk about those. So if you think about um, representative and binding adjudication, class actions, statistical trials, and hybrid proceedings, uh, right? Uh, they will permit the uh, adjudicators to pool information and efficiently bind parties um, and demand that officials respond to their legal claims. Um, these can be especially helpful in large uh, benefit programs, the administration of large benefit programs, and we've seen it a lot in those cases where appellants continually file cases involving very similar legal or factual issues. Um, the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals, or OMHA, has used statistical sampling to resolve thousands of similar cases, um, sometimes involving the same issue, the same beneficiary, and only with a different date of service, um, without the time and resources that would be necessary to adjudicate all of these thousands of cases individually. The Dutch tax uh, court proceedings organize and resolve thousands of identical objections to foreign levies and housing assessments. Um, and aggregate procedures can also provide uniform and consistent application of the law, particularly in cases where individuals are seeking indivisible relief, like injunctions or declaratory relief, um, such as the discrimination claims that are heard by the EEOC. But at the same time, aggregate adjudication can sometimes create diseconomies of scale, inviting even more claims than the agencies have the capacity to administer uh, uh, to so many people. OMHA adjudicators and personnel worried about creating backlogs to another backlog when they started using the statistical sampling initiative and developed a formal program uh, slowly um, in order to uh, respond to that concern. Concentrating many cases uh, before the same judge also puts this pressure on accuracy of the decisions, particularly if they're binding on absent parties. Uh, plaintiffs in the United States Vaccine Court were anxious about commencing cases uh, together, and members of the public health community also were founded on settling that the safety of vaccines was being adjudicated by special masters in an obscure uh, administrative proceeding. There are also concerns with legitimacy, particularly if parties are unable to opt out of the proceedings in favor of an individualized uh, determination. This may undermine personal autonomy. Um, some hospitals and medical suppliers resisted OMHA's statistical sampling program out of the fear that a single adjudicator's view about the medical necessity of a small sample of claims um, would be then extrapolated to thousands of others. So agencies have responded to these uh, concerns in a number of different ways. Um, first, by ensuring that the claims are sufficiently similar. Uh, oh, there you go. I'm just, I'm just going to populate That's all of this because <laughs> I'm not good at that. <laughs> um, OK, uh, so ensuring that claims are sufficiently similar to avoid uh, numerous individual questions uh, or piecemeal adjudica uh, adjudication. Um, federal agencies have typically used the, these uh, procedures in injunctive and declaratory relief actions 
where uh, all the parties can sh uh, are going to be impacted in the same way by the agency's decision. Um, Medicare uh, in its mediation program, which we didn't talk about, um, but they also had a mediation program at the same time as they developed the statistical sampling program. Um, they sought to ensure there that the claims in the mediation program were similar enough, included all related claims so the providers didn't submit uh, their weakest claims to mediation and save their best claims for adjudication. And some agencies have diversified their decision makers. Um, to decrease the risk of bias or error. So uh, in the vaccine uh, program, as Adam mentioned, they had a panel of three adjudicators uh, that they used uh, to address the connections between uh, certain vaccines and certain injuries. Um, in Omaha, Omaha now requires multiple adjudicators to hear uh, different samples of claims in their statistical uh, adjudication. Um, Finally, uh, agencies have also tried to pay close attention to developing uh, competent counsel and ensuring competent legal representation to protect the rights of individual stakeholders. The EOC often relies on steering committees of experienced lawyers to organize and manage common discovery, um, and their rules allow them to conduct fairness hearings like those that are conducted in federal court, uh, permitting objectors, um, associations, and others to raise concerns about the final relief that might be awarded. Um, in representative and non-binding adjudication, these also have significant promise. Uh, these investigations, commissions, and public inquiries give people a uh, voice, allow government decision makers to pool information they need to formulate comprehensive policies, solutions that impact a lot of different people. Um, but because they don't make binding determinations, officers have a lot more freedom to follow the facts uh, wherever they lead. Um, but in terms of efficiency, non-binding group procedures can produce costly, time-consuming, and indeterminate results. Some um, public inquiries go on for years, um, and there's not necessarily an immediate remedy at the end of this. Moreover, by increasing kind of the government's power uh, their legitimacy to uh, investigate and make new policies. Um, at the same time, it undermines another kind of legitimacy, which is personal autonomy and individual legal rights. Um, some have complained that the UK uh, public inquiries are not subject to a, a burden of proof um, and thus may uh, jeopardize parallel criminal or civil uh, trials, which must uh, find facts beyond a reasonable doubt or more likely than not. Um, so agencies have responded to this. Uh, the UK commissions have attempted to uh, increase reasoned deliberation in their fact-finding um, without unduly uh, constraining their commissions, um, more notice to interested parties, opportunities to, opportunities to object, um, and uh, reasons that allow a citizen to understand the result that the agency um, reaches. Nevertheless, the House of Lords has stopped short of requiring that decision makers dot every I and cross every T. Um, and in so doing, they've tried to balance uh, individual procedural rights with the collective interest in finding, in finding facts. And finally, in non-representative and binding adjudication, centralized docketing, case management, algorithmic assignments, they can promote efficiency, resolve large numbers of similar cases, uh, with these expedited procedures and specialized adjudicators. Um, at the same time, they protect the individual's right to control um, and participate in their own uh, cases because they're non-representative. Um, the, uh, the, the streamlining mechanisms help uh, to, to get through backlogs to a certain extent um, um, and to better understand cases before perhaps they're aggregated in a binding or representative way. So, for example, the vaccine court, uh, before using kind of binding representative procedures uh, with novel cases, would allow uh, them to kind of percolate among individual adjudicators so they'd have a better idea about how to address a large case of claims um, in a single aggregate proceeding. Um, such an approach can provide the agency and future policies with valuable insights into how a large number of cases actually will be um, decided in the future. Um, but, with, but these solutions may sacrifice accuracy in other ways. 
Without a representative process, adjudicators and parties may lack access to experts, um, to competent counsel, to interest groups who are sometimes better equipped to gather information um, and present it to the adjudicators. And also, if it's serial uh, individualized adjudication, um, there still is a great risk of delays and inconsistent results. Um, in some cases, administrative agencies in the United States have turned to big data to try to address these questions. In 2011, the Social Security Administration began uh, coding decisions to track uh, rules which created confusion, uh, dissension, and delay in their Social Security hearings. They coded the rationales used to resolve approximately 2,000 types of decisions and different disability claims, and ultimately tracking these uh, millions of disability opinions in a uh, kind of a sophisticated electronic database um, due in part to this. Uh, SSA, SSA has seen a, a reduction in the backlog of, of over 30 uh, percent in just two years from a high of 1.1 million um, to 858,000 uh, last year. So that may have some promise. Okay, so notwithstanding the potential benefits of aggregate adjudication, it still remains the exception, and we should be clear about that. It is especially true um, for representative forms of adjudication that bind uh, individuals. And this may reflect the concern that we talked about earlier about protecting an individual's right to an administrative decision-making body um, particularly an uh, administrative decision based on their case, particularly when the administrative de uh, decision maker may be trying to implement policy. Um, individualized hearing procedures may be seen as a way to protect them from this open policy making and compromises um, that sometimes arise in group hearings. Um, there may also be a uh, concern with adjudicators punching above their pay grade um, in making policy in these individual adjudications. But this individualized view of adjudication may also undermine day in court ideals um, by creating backlogs of similar claims and preventing adjudicators from resolving cases consistently, efficiently, and accurately. In OMHA, um, OMHA notified pr uh, prospective claimants that they would not be able to formally docket new filed cases for over four months because of the growing backlog that it faced in 2015, um, a backlog that I, I know has been brought down um, significantly since then. Um, and in the Netherlands, uh, the test case procedure was essential to consistently determine thousands of cases raising common tax designations. So active case management and outreach may also promote access to lawyers, experts, and other stakeholders so that you get a meaningful uh, day in court or heard in a meaningful way. Um, so individualized views of adjudication may also stymie enforcement efforts um, and efforts to develop informed policies. The vaccine court um, has a vaccine table, table, which is essentially rulemaking, and it was administratively modified um, consistent with the, the uh, vaccine court's aggregate proceedings to make it easier for future claimants to establish injuries associated with the rubella vaccine. So the aggregate adjudication then had, a, you know, had an impact upon policy, allowing some of the people with the best view of the issues involved to take first crack at a rule that can be later implemented um, through uh, rulemaking. And class actions and large cases tend to attract more attention and therefore can spur uh, regulatory change. Um, managed properly, uh, we think that aggregate adjudication gives agencies another a tool to avoid bottlenecks and inconsistencies in their decisions, promote legal access to administrative uh, justice, um, and allow agencies to listen to stakeholders and experts and develop it when they're developing their new policies. Um, it also raises questions about the division between rulemaking and adjudication that we talked about um, earlier on the first panel. Um, experience with aggregate adjudication suggests that some judicial proceedings require integrating tools of rulemaking, managerial control, complex fact-finding, and outreach to diverse constituencies in order to ensure that uh, administrative adjudication provides feasible, accurate, and fair avenues for relief. 
Thank you. Pretty, please. Great, I'll stand as well because I will stay more active that way and hopefully keep you guys awake. Uh, so I think I'm the last speaker before lunch, which is always not an enviable position to be in. Uh, and somebody left their notes here. Oh, it wasn't mine. Okay. Uh, all right, so I'm going to go in a very different direction from the last sets of speakers who are looking at um, high volume adjudication. Um, trademarks, uh, you know, as, as uh, Melissa and Michael point out, there are millions of them, um, hundreds of thousands of adjudications uh, every year. Um, and uh, the last speaker is just specifically focused on mass adjudication. I'm going to focus on the opposite end of the spectrum. What do we do when there's an administrative adjudication when there are very high commercial stakes? So this is the PTAB, Patent Trial and Appeals Board. And unfortunately, Chief Judge Bullock has stepped out, so, or maybe fortunately, so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> um, so I've written a lot on the PTAB, and the PTAB in general deals with, very, with high commercial stakes because it's only going to get involved after the patent is already issued and my prior work has shown that it basically you almost always gets involved when there's already district court litigation going on. Somebody has already asserted the patent. You don't assert a patent unless there are at least hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake. So this is the opposite end of the spectrum. Now I'm going to go to an extreme opposite end of the spectrum, very high commercial strikes, drug patents. Those are the highest commercial stakes one can see in the patent system. Um, they are the cases where billions of dollars can be lost. B I L L I O N, not millions. Okay, so what do we see there? I think it's really interesting because this is where um, we get, as you've, you probably have heard already, the PTAB has been subject to constant constitutional challenge, constant statutory challenge over and over again. And part of the reason I, I think, I don't think I'd be going too far on a limb to say this, is that it deals with so much money, as contrasted with other types of cases that are low monetary stakes, maybe high human stakes, but low monetary stakes. And drug patents are, as I said, the extreme of that um, situation. So as soon as the PTAB was created, we immediately got legislation, uh, legislative attempts to carve out drug patents. So we had this major set of um, kind of pub public arguments being made by various lobbying groups saying that drug patents are special. This is going to disrupt the delicate balance we've already set up by a statute called, via statute called Hesh Waxman. So um, that played out for a while, and we almost got a carve out for drug patents. Um, but then we got some pushback because everyone now is not concerned about drug prices and bad patents increasing drug prices. And so that counter narrative has created a situation where there has been some bipartisan discussion of using the PTAB to deal with these bad patents. And so the PTAB, I think, is a little more protected, at least in that respect, on the legislative side. Now, the constitutional side, we're going to see many more challenges, I suspect. Um, and I don't think, just to be clear, because I think the prior panel might have suggested that the PTAB was particularly constitutionally deficient. I don't think that's the case at all. I think it just happens to be the case that it handles cases with lots of money involved. And many of its deficiencies, I think, are shared by other agencies. Um, and I, I can talk about that in the Q&A if, if we get to that. OK, so um, what are bad patents in the drug context? I'm not going to. I'm really going to zip through these slides because I know, as I said, I'm right before lunch. Um, it's a difficult question. It's not an easy question to answer. And my co-authors and I on this paper are spending a lot of time thinking about that because we don't think the prior literature has done a particularly good job in thinking about that. Um, but for our purposes, in the few minutes that I have, I'll say that at least I know what a good patent is in this space. And a good patent, where there are very few false positives, um, is going to be a patent on the initial compound, the initial stuff of the drug, whether it be a small molecule of pills or a large molecule injectables. Just again, very crudely, that's the division I'm going to make between small molecules and large molecules. 
Okay, so I can tell you what a good patent is. I'm not gonna go into the bad patent stuff because we haven't figured out exactly how to determine that yet. So um, this is just a slide that shows you why there's so much money involved after a patent loss. Um, you pretty much get to marginal cost. The, the lowest line there is it's getting, after you lose your patents, you lose all your profits, basically. So you're just gonna be fighting for those last patents. And the bad patents are often considered to be the ones that are the eight or 10 additional patents you um, pile on after your first patent. Now, again, I, I think that's a little too simplistic, but we'll leave it at that. So Congress that kind of anticipated this, they anticipated that there would be a piling on of additional patents known as evergreening. Some of you may have heard that term. Um, and they set up this system in district court where um, so you put all your patents on something called the Orange Book. It, used to, it still is a physical book. Nobody looks at it anymore. Um, it's orange, um, or was orange. Um, and uh, so you duke it out in district court. The generics have a bounty that they get if they can challenge your bad patents, allegedly bad patents, um, because there's like a significant collective action problem in validating patents. Um, basically, particularly in this context, if you invalidate a patent, you do it for all your competitors as well. So you're giving them free money, essentially, by invalidating the patent. So was, the idea was we will give an incentive to invalidate the bad patents uh, through this bounty. Well, the problem, as with many good schemes, is that they didn't figure out how clever lawyers could be. And lawyers have been extremely clever with this scream, uh, scheme. So what we've had is, this is before the PTAB, this tension between piling on more and more patents at the front end from the originator firm and then the generics prospecting for that 180 day exclusivity kind of across the board. So they're, um, they're two competing tales being told. The brand names are saying um, these generics are just going after us even after our good patents because they want that bounty. So I don't think this is the best way to solve the collective action problem. Um, I don't think uh, district court litigation is the best way to solve the collective action problem, and certainly not the bounty. Two minutes, okay, all right. So, um, all right, so basically let's skip ahead on all the other slides um, and talk about why so what we've basically gotten in district court litigation is an expensive fight to draw, so only the lawyers can be happy about this. And I know we're all lawyers, so we're happy, I guess, but this is not good for society. <laughs> and it's even worse in the context of the injectable drugs, the biologics. There you really get um, expensive fights. And in fact, even worse, you don't get generics or biosimilars being launched at all. So 50% um, of our biopharma spend is now approximately 50% is on biologics, and um, we have very little generic competition or biosimilar competition. So what we're doing in this research is looking to see, this is just some, the number of patents involved in some litigation over biologics. It's, is there real patent figures there? What we're doing um, is looking to see whether PTAB has helped in any of this. Can lower cost administrative adjudication solve the collective action problem of invalidating bad patents better in cases where every, where all the parties involved are incredibly well lawyered, can look for every constitutional defect, every statutory defect. I mean, this is the opposite of the sorts of mass adjudication that others have talked about. Can the PTAB help? And that's what we're doing. Um, fortunately, given my lack of time, we have some preliminary results suggesting yes, maybe, but on the other hand, but see the fact that now PTAB judges are no longer subject uh, to any sort of protections from firing, as a consequence of the case of our direct, where mm -hmm. a bunch of clever lawyers found an alleged constitutional appointment clause problem. So I'll leave it at that. That's the larger picture. Thank you.